Grenadians find employment on Canadian farms. Details to this story and more in the National Report. With the details to the news for Wednesday, September 18th, I am Leslie Ann Johnson. Close to 50 Grenadians are now employed on two farms in Canada as part of the Canada Caribbean Seasonal Agriculture Program. 26 men left the island on Saturday on a two-year contract with one farmer and a further 21 left on Monday on a six-month contract. The two groups comprise a mix of first-time workers and others who have been recalled. Prior to their departure, the men participated in a round-table video conference with officials from the Eastern Caribbean Liaison Service, where they were briefed on the rules and regulations to be adhered to on the farms. Labour Minister the Honourable Peter David says the increased number of men gaining employment on the farms is as a result of the excellent relationship between the farmers and the government through the Ministry of Labour. Over the years, we've seen many of them go, they repeat, they go, they come, they go, they come. And many of them have been proven so satisfactory that they've nearly become permanent employees of the farmers in Canada. Uh, so I want to, 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 to congratulate this group that has gone out and to urge them uh, to take advantage of the experience, take advantage of the employment, and, and do it in a way that provides the farmers in Canada with the confidence that Grenadian mm -hmm. workers are capable of, uh, of doing, doing what is necessary to keep the employment. Minister David says the selection of farm workers is not done by employees in the Ministry of Labour, but by the farmers themselves. I also want to say to the young people in Grenada that we at the Ministry, we do not decide who goes on a programme. What we do, we take the applications, we take the records, we, we collect the documents, and we provide it to the farmers in Canada who then come to Grenada and decide for themselves which workers they would like to go on the farm. And uh, they have come and they have done that in, in, in most cases. And as I said, in most cases, they have found the workers satisfactory. He says dialogue continues with consuls general in both Toronto and Montreal to engage stakeholders to create further employment opportunities for Grenada. In hospitality, in nursing, in, in, uh, in, in home care, areas that in particular for me, I, 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 I want to see more women uh, have the capacity to take advantage of these Canadian programs. So we are looking for programs where young women and, and women in general can go to Canada and also have the same opportunities that the young men have been having in a farm labor program. We are working with our council generals, we are working with our, our, our partners in Canada to get that going, and I am confident that over the next several months that will be, will be a, a possibility and that will, will certainly be the outcome of these discussions. 90 men are currently employed on various farms in Canada. As government presses ahead with plans to make St. George's the first climate smart city in the Caribbean, part of the plan includes working with the St. George's University to ensure it is as climate resilient as possible. The SGU is a major contributor to Grenada's GDP. Addressing Tuesday's post-cabinet briefing, Minister for Climate Resilience, Senator Simon Steele, said while still at the concept stage, the Climate Resilient Cities project will address the vulnerability of a number of areas in the country. We're working with New York University in the, uh, the development of the concepts. We have received um, pre-feasibility support from the GCF to enable us to do this, but it's looking at interventions such as the areas of sea level rise, um, the vulnerabilities of the Carinage, Grand Ants, Grenville. Um, solutions engineered, both hard engineered and nature-based solutions to protect those valuable um, areas. Uh, whether it is the protection of Morris Bishop International Airport, our runways at sea level, highly vulnerable, how we can protect that, and how we can work with St. George's University, which contributes in excess of 20% of our GDP, how can we can work with them to ensure that the campus is as climate resilient as possible so that it will sustain as, uh, as little damage in an extreme event. He says government is also looking at urban planning to determine how they can address vulnerabilities in some communities that are at risk. Looking at our road system, how we can reduce uh, congestion uh, uh, solutions there. And then the areas of capacity building, strengthening government and the private sector's ability to, uh, to deal with climate change moving forward. It is here to stay, in addition to identifying other community-based um, solutions. 
This is the National Report. More news after the break. Make sure you have your radio and your batteries to waterproof flashlight candles will do kin stuff garbage back first aid kit. Come on people, make sure you have it. Clean water in a container and a hurricane plan. Hear me no man. Hurricane damage is beyond your control. Surviving the aftermath is up to you. Have a hurricane plan. It can save your life and your family too. Prepare for hurricane, your hair prepare for hurricane. Continuing the news, a marriage between tourism and agriculture has been the subject of discussion for some time. The Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, IGA, wants to do its part to make this a reality in Grenada through the development of an agro-tourism policy. Meetings were held over the last two days to brainstorm and come up with a plan on the best way forward. Details in this report by Karima Lewis. Agriculture and tourism have been identified as two major economic sectors that have not been fully optimized. And in an effort to strengthen linkages between the two sectors, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, ICA, is in the process of developing an agro-tourism policy. This OECS initiative has seen workshops taking place in a number of Caribbean countries, Grenada being no exception. As many farmers, fishers, and tourism stakeholders convened at the Radisson Grenada Beach Resort to put ideas forward in a two-day workshop. The objective of such a venture is to maximize the full potential of the farming, fishing, and tourism sectors, while at the same time encouraging local food use and consumption. Eco representative for the OECS, Greg Rollins, says the prospects for further developing agritourism linkages in Grenada are encouraging. I should emphasize that the establishment of the agritourism linkages will, however, require significant changes. We need to adopt new approaches. It will not happen automatically. We need to adopt appropriate technologies and sound agribusiness management practices that stimulate increases in productivity, production, and competitiveness to ensure a consistent and reliable supply of competitively priced primary and value-added products and services to the sector. We need to be able to adhere to stringent food safety, quality, labor, environmental, and other standards. Minister of Agriculture and Lands, Honorable Yulin Bean Hosford, is confident that local farmers can meet the demand of the tourism sector for meals and beverages. It is important to note that food represents roughly 30% of the total tourist, tourist expenditure, which implies that there is vast potential for local producers. I am confident that our producers of food have the capacity to supply in a consistent manner a major part of the culinary needs of the tourism sector. Minister for Tourism and Civil Aviation, Honorable Clarice Modest Cohen, explains that agritourism allows for the natural adaptation of the agriculture and tourism sectors as it provides benefits for all involved. So it brings to light an aspect of community tourism, farm-based tourism, culinary tourism, agro-heritage tourism, agro-eco-tourism, and agro-trade. And therefore it is important for the Ministry of Tourism, as we make a concerted effort to assist in enhancing livelihood, a major aspect of our community-based tourism development program for the coming years. Presenter at the workshop, Kimberly Thomas Francois, describes one of the linkages between tourism and agriculture. Food has allowed, uh, when tourists have a particular link with what they eat, it has allowed repeat guests. And uh, so more or less establishing that linkage actually helps hotel in the sense that the marketing dollar that they have to spend to bring new tourists, they would, actually, they would see repeat guests coming uh, just because of the food. Eka Hemispheric Specialist in Agrotourism, Anna Harvey, explains her role at the workshop. I'm giving the overall picture on global and international trends in agro-tourism and food tourism, talking about all of the things that are happening to link agriculture with tourism in all its dimensions, from farm to table, boat to throat, right up to the craft and artisanal sector. One of the organizers of West Indian Breakfast, Lionel Goddard, explains that one of the benefits that can be derived from this policy is having readily accessible local produce to include in the breakfast sale. So we think this, this policy could, one, help our small and medium-sized farmers, you know, give them um, funding, 
give them, you know, technical advice, you know, and make the whole process, you know, of farming develop in a much, much, much um, bigger way. And so by our farmers growing, it could help our breakfast also to grow in terms of what we, we are planning to do and execute. For the Ministry of Agriculture, I am Karima Lewis. And finally, several bus drivers from across the country are embracing positive development and safety. They're partnering with the Ministry of Education, Human Resource Development and Religious Affairs as part of the UNICEF-funded Child-Friendly Schools Initiative. Details from Annette Moore. The Child-Friendly Schools Initiative focuses on positive discipline, meaningful student participation, student-centered classrooms, parental and community involvement, and health and family life education. Bus drivers are now displaying banners with child-friendly and positive messages on their buses as an endorsement of this movement. They will also ensure that their buses are safe spaces for children. The drivers were officially recognized during an appreciation ceremony at Spice Basket on September 11th. Your involvement takes three particular forms that I want to raise. Safety, and in an era where we have increasing levels of child abuse from different angles. It's heartwarming to know that we have drivers among us, drivers who are willing to say, we support child-friendly schools, we support keeping children safe, we support positive discipline, we support the idea of letting them know what needs to happen. So that's one, safety. The second issue is linkage, and linking home, school, and community. When we work with homes and we work in schools, the transportation medium is a very important link between all of this. And if you are partnering with us to ensure that the travel experiences are safe and not emotionally disturbing or anything of that sort, then we're creating a firm, safe link. The third thing is positive discipline. What do I mean by that? When we speak positive discipline, we refer to a style of discipline that is proactive. In other words, it seeks to create the behaviors we want to see. You notice on your stickers, the stickers that you have, there are some very positive comments, like, um, I'm, I'm ready, be respectful, I don't know which ones you have, be focused, whatever is on your bus, you'll see that. All of those are positively stated statements of expectation. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Kevin Andel, further emphasized the importance of bus drivers providing a safe and positive environment for children. These children travel with you every day. Almost 75% of our school age children travel on buses. And those who have their parents who drop them off sometimes still have to traverse this country on your buses. And because of that, you have a significant responsibility in regards to the next world, safety, bringing them safe to their destination. And when I say safe, I mean a safe environment. And your buses should be a safe environment for these children. Not only that, it should be a model of positivity that riding on your buses they should be exposed to the attitudes and the, thank you very much, and the behaviors that we wish for them to model. Ian George, a Grenville St. George's route bus driver, spoke on behalf of the participating bus drivers. On behalf of the operators, the bus operators, I just want to say thank you very much. And uh, I do appreciate, we do appreciate the involvement with the Ministry of Education to have us partner with them in this very important initiative. From what we have learned from, by listening to your description of, of what this is all about, I think it's very commendable. In fact, it's a very good initiative that may have been long with you. There are a lot of reminders here that would help us to make a greater contribution, not just in transporting the young ones, but in helping in their development by providing good, safe environment for the transport. 
George also says he hopes that more bus drivers can participate. Bus drivers, making a difference, keeping our children safe. Approximately 17 buses are participating thus far, with stickers displayed on 14 buses to date. For the National Report, I'm Annette Moore. And that's the National Report. I'm Leslie Ann Johnson.